It's the holidays, the family are all together, everyone is laughing and being merry. But suddenly, someone brings up something and next thing you know, everyone is fighting. Why the sudden conflict and most importantly, how can you stop it? Welcome to The Chrissy B Show, the UK's only TV programme that's dedicated to your mental health and well-being. And today we're talking about conflict and confrontation and explaining the mental ins and outs of disagreements and fights is our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang. We also have newsreader Helena Shard giving us the latest in positive news, which is sure to put you in the festive spirit. And resident nutritionist Lily Suta gives us a scrumptious recipe that you can make over the holidays. We also show you a video courtesy of Head Talks on how one Instagram influencer used social media as a platform to recover from serious self-esteem and body issues. And we also have resident declutterer Sally Warford showing us how to organise those pesky decorations. Then at the end of the show, I give you my tips on how to handle confrontation. Now, according to Psychology Today, conflict is defined as a disagreement, whereas confrontation is the active art of acknowledging or asserting a difference between parties. Conflicts can be portrayed in different ways and includes bickering, arguing, passive aggression and giving the silent treatment. Conflicts among family members also stem from clashing opinions being highlighted over a household's core similarities, as an article from The Atlantic states. However, confrontation and conflict doesn't have to be exclusively negative, with healthy disagreements following a triple A pattern of agreement, augmentation and addition to a party's side of the argument. So what do you on Twitter think about conflict during the holidays? Kendra says, don't be afraid of confrontation. Life is too short. Say what's on your mind. Tatiana says, if you avoid problems, avoid confrontation, can't talk about your issue or communicate your feelings with me, then we are not going to work out. That goes for friendships and relationships. You've got to communicate with me. Closed mouths don't get fed. <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing and see how far we get. Kaylee says, Thanksgiving always goes well right until the inner conservative comes out of my drunk family members and I sit silently to avoid confrontation. And Ash says, two things I'm good at, drinking coffee and avoiding confrontation. So some very interesting thoughts there. So what does our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang, have to say about confrontation and conflict? Well, here she is. Welcome to the show, Audrey. Thanks for having me, Chrissy. So tell us, what actually happens to us mentally when we face confrontation and conflict? It's as much a physiological reaction as it is a psychological, and a lot of the physiology affects the psychology. So what tends to happen is it's a similar response to the fear response. Our hearts start pumping, we mm -hmm. start getting a little bit clammy, um, our cortisol, the stress hormone starts rising, and it's a very unpleasant feeling. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when there's a lot of cortisol floating about, um, we begin to get more impulsive and that's when we okay. end up just saying something and we haven't really thought it through. It's almost as if the filter that usually goes on has just been switched off and that's how things escalate. So okay. it's, it's not a pleasant feeling. I mean, obviously we can't avoid confrontation, but is, is there, oh, we can to a certain extent, but we can't go through, you know, for a yeah. lifetime, not, you know, not going through these things yeah. because it's a normal part of life, isn't it? it Where is. there's people, more than one person, there will be some yeah. kind of confrontation. But what maybe are some of the... Um, the negative effects on a person maybe in the long term? If we don't actually confront whatever it is that's been troubling us, mm -hmm. um, the best example comes from a piece of research on tree shrews. Now, what these little animals do is they're very territorial and mm -hmm. they will fight to the death over a bit of territory. But what research has found, and there were ethical guidelines followed, mm -hmm. um, was that if a tree shrew on one side of an enclosure saw a tree shrew that was more dominant on the other side, even if they were never going to fight, the less dominant tree shrew, their cortisol would rise, the heartbeat would go faster, and they would literally worry themselves to death. Oh. So if we let it all bubble up and stew inside us, yeah. it's really not healthy because it's the same thing. We're keeping our heart rate high, we're keeping the amount of stress hormones um, in our bodies high, and that's not good for us. So mm. we do actually need to release that. And ideally, when it comes to dealing with conflict, we need to do it when it's easy to deal with. In other words, when maybe it's just a bit of a frustration. It's just a little bit irritating. Before it gets out of hand. Absolutely. And if we okay. sit there and stew about it, it's like replaying it over yes. and over again. It gets worse, doesn't and it? it gets worse. Yes. Because it's almost like making the imprint bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when you, you come to talk about it, you almost, the phrase is literally, it's throwing the kitchen sink. It's yeah. everything comes out, not even what you were wanting to argue about or co 
confront, yeah. but actually all the other issues that caused problems before unfortunately come out and then it's hard to resolve things because it's mm. got so emotional. Okay. So it is really important to start doing it when it's a frustration. So Audrey, when can conflict and confrontation actually be a good thing? Actually when it starts to broaden your horizons a little bit more because mm. if we only rely on our own mindset, we, we're not actually learning anything new, we're not actually gaining new information. Mm -hmm. So if we confront something, even though one of the fears of confrontation is a fear of failure, in other words, a fear of us looking bad or us being yeah. wrong, mm -hmm. we still might learn something new and that can be quite important. Also, if you think something and someone else thinks something else, then maybe there's a collaboration that can be brought together. You yeah. can learn something from them, they can learn something from you and you can move forward together. Mm -hmm. um, psychologists would say we, we will fear to have that confrontation because we also don't want to cause pain to another person. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes if confronting whatever it is is actually better for their well-being, at least you've moved forward yeah, and you can yeah. start managing it. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's better to feel the stress for five minutes rather than endure a longer period yeah, of just, just stewing and worrying yeah, about right. it. Okay. But we can learn a lot from each other, that's quite important. And Audrey, we did get a question from a viewer as well, mm -hmm. like how can you actually kind of stop yourself from maybe exploding when you're at that point where you know you want to say something and it's yeah. like you don't you want to say something but at the same time you're kind of trying to hold it in sometimes you might have to leave the situation and come back to it when you're less emotional but if you are going to walk out away from the situation it's best to say to somebody I really can't talk about this right now but I am going to come back and I am going to talk about it in say two hours time because if you just walk out yeah. then that person doesn't know whether you're coming back what's happening or runs after you and makes the situation exactly worse. Yeah. so sometimes it's walking away from it but then it may be a case of writing down your thoughts and being aware of, right, I feel this, I think this, I must talk about these things. Because then when you come to discuss it in a more um, calm frame of mind, mm -hmm. then actually you're not pulled off by the emotion that is going to come yeah. back when yeah. you start discussing it again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it may also be better to discuss it on more neutral territory. Um, debate over this as to whether you do this in a public place because the idea is if you're in a public place you're more likely to keep it <laughs> a bit more quieter yeah. shall we say a little bit more civil but then again that can be even more frustrating but if the conflict is say um, a, a teacher and a student for example yeah. One of the less safe places that the student will feel is, is in the teacher's office because it's the teacher's territory, it's the teacher's okay, area. So, so having yeah. it in the canteen mm -hmm. or somewhere a bit more neutral may help. So it's same thing. If it's always one person who wants to discuss something, maybe not having it their house because again, you suddenly feel on the back foot. So yeah. it's about dealing with the issue when you're calm and able to deal with it, keeping an agenda with you so that you don't get pulled off the point mm -hmm. and always thinking that you're working to resolve it, not working to win because once you're talking about winning, then you're also talking about losing. You're not talking about collaborating and actually moving forward together. Love that, I think we're gonna end it on that, Audrey. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And we'll see you again next week. Yes. Thank you. All right, everybody, now are you feeling a little bit blue? Well, here's Helena Shah to perk you up with some cheery good news that's sure to lift your spirits. Welcome to the show, Helena. Thank you, Chrissy. So what happy news do you have for us today on our um, show about conflict well, and conversation? Exactly. <laughs> Actually, news-wise, it was slightly, well, it's quite diverse. Okay. But I just wanted to start off with that despite everything, everyone has to still remember the spirit mm -hmm. of the festive periods and not to lose that because everyone's nerves are frayed and in the true traditional family sense, yeah. so much happens. But there was a really nice thing I read on the Salvation, Web, uh, Salvation Army website, which mm -hmm. is just it's a time where imperfect individuals come together to love each other in, um, imperfectly, which is actually something worth celebrating because mm -hmm. everyone's always trying their best. And, yeah. But it is a time as well to, to be aware, isn't it? To be aware and to chill and to various things. Yes, anyway, definitely. but starting, I mean, I think one of the main things is people find themselves in different situations and everyone mm -hmm. talks about the typical traditional family, but people find themselves estranged and, you know, have to move out of London, etc. So mm -hmm. it's a very different situation for everybody. And also something quite sweet. So obviously we've got, again, traditional family and various things going on, but there's lots of people in the military that don't have a festive time. Mm -hmm. And it was a lovely story about uh, military sons um, were telling their, their mum that a lot of people don't get pe care packages because she was used to send them 
uh, presents. Okay. And lots of the people around them didn't get it, so they felt quite bad. Anyway, so she set up a charity called Support the Troops, and in fact has sent her 10,000th package wow. of, and the most recent ones have all been Christmas bundles of yeah, loveliness. Yeah. And it's just, it, you know, obviously that they're so thankful, and it's just cheered That's everyone lovely. up yeah. for Christmas. Really nice. Isn't that Imagine lovely? how lonely you must feel with being yeah. away from friends and family, they're not getting anything as well, and seeing other no, people get it. seeing other people get it. Yeah. It makes you, makes you think, um, which, which is lovely. And there was actually a young boy that did it as well, mm -hmm. um, who raised 2,000 pounds, and it was because he saw his brother as well and he okay. said the same thing but it's it's just a, a really nice thing it's again it's giving isn't it what's mm -hmm. it's what it's all about is trying to give yeah. give back or help people that are maybe Not just want 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 for yeah. yourself right absolutely um, another sweet story in fact i'm going to um yes did you ever have a pen pal when you were younger did i i can't remember I think I might have done, but it was like, well, probably when I was really did small, you? but I can't remember can't what remember it was. It. I can't vaguely I remember sort of something. Do. I remember yeah. writing letters to a friend yeah. in France and yeah. going over there, and it was really good fun. But this is just something very simple. That obviously, you know, we've got the modern the Twitter and Instagram, all the rest of it, so the young can join in. But obviously, if you're elderly, you haven't got that kind of yeah. support. And it's something which has got a double whammy. So children at a school in Kidderminster have teamed up with two local care homes and they, it's an intergenerational pen pal scheme, so they write to each other. Oh. And genuinely, the elderly feel really connected and love it, and they cannot believe that the youngsters are, are truly oh. interested in them. Yeah. But the young kids love it as well, because they hear about their lives and what they did when they were younger. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. just put a lot of happiness in both generations. Oh, so Isn't lovely. that really nice? Yeah. So I was thinking even something Do small think. like that at Christmas or a festive time, just to have that hope and, and those letters is really... Yeah. Really lovely. Really nice. So instead of kind of concentrating on family Conflict. conflicts and stuff yeah. and confrontations and what's going on and all, all these kind of things, when you actually take your focus off that and put it on, yeah. what can I do to Absolutely. help? Absolutely. Let's take the focus off us and put it mm. on someone else. And it that makes you feel help. good, it doesn't it? Good and all those things are not important. Absolutely. Thank does. you, Helena, for that lovely Thank news. Thank you, Chrissy. And we shall see you again next week. Absolutely. Well, everyone, don't go away because after the break, we show you a video courtesy of Head Talks on how one Instagrammer used social media to overcome her mental health issues. But first, how many times a year do couples bicker? Is it A, 1,455, B, 2,455, or C, 3,455? Do you think you know the answer? Find out if you're correct after this break. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone. Your program for all things mental health and well-being. Now, before the break, we asked you, how many times a year do couples bicker? Is it A, 1,455, B, 2,455, or C, 3,455? The answer is B. According to the Daily Mail, couples pick an average of 2,455 times a year, with money issues, laziness, and not listening being the top conflicts for couples. Now, with all this talk about conflict, it's important to remember the conflicts we deal with inside of ourselves. And here, influencer Steph Ellswood talks about how she came to terms with her struggles with self-esteem, body positivity and an eating disorder, and how she turned her recovery into her passion. I trained as a dancer from the age of four and then I went into professional dance training at the age of about 14. So I went to do my GCSEs at the Performing Arts School Italia Conti and I studied there for year 9, 10 and 11 and I was so happy to be pursuing my dream alongside my academic um, work. So at the age of about 15 I started to become very aware of my body. Um, it was obviously when I was starting to hit puberty and things like that and I was quite a late bloomer so everyone else in my year was looking more and more like a woman and I was still looking like a little girl um, and it was really getting to me as a child and obviously we were in leotards every day and we were in front of a mirror every day doing ballet and the way our day worked was the morning was academics and the afternoon was vocational training. Now, when I joined this school, I didn't join in year seven like everyone else. I was one of the very few girls that started in the middle of a year, in the middle of the kind of school journey. And 
I found it really hard to fit in at first because no one there was passionate about academics and I was a bit of a geek. So at that age I was torn between being a heart surgeon and a dancer. So on one side I really wanted to dissect everything and learn everything about biology and then on the other side I loved ballet, tap and jazz. So I never really bonded on a level with them and I started to compare myself to the other girls and started to really question myself as a person and wondered why I wasn't fitting in and what I could do to change that. And I thought, um, very naively of me, I thought if I can't be the prettiest or have curves or anything like that, I'll just be the skinny one. So I started to restrict my food and a very crucial enabler of this whole process was the website Tumblr. And at the time, um, things like skins were out on television and, and things like that. And I'd repost loads of skinny girls. I'd be scrolling through my profile at the thinnest girls rather than girls that are curvy because that was what I was aspiring to be like. And I remember one lunchtime, I just had an apple and that was it. And everyone questioned me and I just said I was feeling sick. And then it became more and more regular that I was just having an apple for lunch. When it came to the age of 16, I could either stay on at the same school and go into full-time vocational training or I could move. I was the only one out of my friendship group that decided to move colleges because I sort of fell out with those girls because they thought I was the attention-seeking one and stuff like that. So I auditioned for a few of them um, and also applied for my A-levels because I wasn't sure if I was talented enough to get into a full-time vocational college and I went to the Erdang Academy in Islington and this is one of my biggest dreams. I used to watch their videos on YouTube. Um, it's more commercial dance, so backing dancing for videos and things like that and it was my passion to do that. So I remember when I started, I was one of the youngest in my year because you can either do the degree course where you start at 18 um, after you've done your A-levels or you can be accepted at 16 and do a diploma course. I was on the diploma course and there were still girls that were 25, 26 in my year, like a decade older than me. And I was so excited for a fresh start, to start something new, meet new people. No one from my previous school was going there, so it was a totally fresh slate. And first year was amazing and I loved it and I threw myself into everything. I still had low confidence, but I think that was an age thing at the time that I didn't really realise. And then in my second year, I started to struggle more because we were put into tracks and there was track A, which was the musical theatre track, track B, which was the dance track, track C, which was the singing acting track, and then track D, which was the commercial track. And I was put into classes with the best dancers in my year, the strongest, most flexible, best at performing and I really started to question my worth again and I lost so much confidence because I couldn't kick my legs as high as them or things like that so again I fell into the trap of wanting to be the skinny one and I was really struggling, my skin was grey, I looked ill all the time, my hair was thinning, I had no energy, I couldn't get through a day without having a panic attack because I was so anxious all the time, I had no confidence, I was absolutely tiny, my clothes were falling off me. And then it wasn't until um, I had a really bad panic attack in one of my jazz classes that the head of dance pulled me to one side and said that they were all, the, all the staff and the faculty were worried about me. I went home to my mum and told her the situation and how I thought food was the enemy, how I wanted to be the skinniest I could and how I didn't know how to stop and get out of this vicious cycle. So my mum obviously panicked again and then got upset because she didn't notice it. And she took me to my GP, who referred me to this amazing um, hospital called the Maudsley Hospital, which is in Denmark Hill. And I went there once a week for an hour to see my angel. So I called her my angel because I didn't want to tell anyone what I was doing. And I just went and spoke to her um, once a week about my problems. She gave me ways to, um, ways to make myself better, so little tips to make me aware of when I was being negative to myself or kind of body checking so I used to I wouldn't be able to walk past a mirror without pinching my fat or seeing how much fat was on me and she kind of made me aware of that so that I could stop myself before I did it and I was with her for a year and then it started going from once a week to once a month and I became more and more passionate about food and I found my love for it again and I started to get really inventive with my cooking and I was so proud of what I was making I started taking photos, photos of it and posting it on my personal Instagram and at the time I was still living that uni lifestyle when everyone was going out and eating pizza so they didn't care that I was eating this amazing quinoa salad with avocado on the side and they started commenting like Steph we don't care 
about your lunch, like go away. So I started this um, Instagram in private and I used to always refer to myself as Chef Steph. I'd post these meals that I created because I was so proud of them. And it was a way for my mum to see that I was getting excited about food again, it wasn't the enemy. And I started posting more and more and more and I started to tag brands and my following started to grow. It was really slow to start with, but I, I loved it. And it was something that I did three times a day, every day, and it was a way of making me better. And I'll never forget, I think I had about 5,000 followers at the time, and I got a message from Nike, and I was like, this can't be real, but I saw the little blue tick, and I was like, oh my God, Nike have messaged me. And they were inviting me to take me away for three days to Stockholm, and they were with, um, 10 influencers that I followed that I was inspired by that had thousands more followers than me but I felt so privileged to be there and I didn't think anything of it until I was sat on the plane on the way there. We landed in Stockholm and these huge influencers were there and I had the best weekend ever and when I came back I went to my first dance audition since graduating and I was absolutely humiliated by the casting director. He singled me out and was so nasty to me because I'd never been to his dance class. And I, th I sat and I thought, why am I putting myself through an audition process where I give 100% in a room to a casting panel and they just criticise me on the way I look or the way I move or my height or things that I can't necessarily change or I can focus all my energy on this Instagram page that's starting to build a following where I'm working with brands like Nike and actually making a difference. So I decided that performing wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do anymore and I put all this energy and time into this Instagram and slowly but surely I got more and more of a following and um, people are now wanting to know more about my story and ever since then it's become my full-time job. Thank you very much to Head Talks for that video and if you'd like to know more about them please do head over to our website chrissybshow.tv and click on our contributors section. Now Steph mentioned an important aspect of self-care which is body positivity and nothing gets us loving our bodies more than reminding ourselves of the incredible things it can do. So here's Feja Jedi giving us a powerful workout that helps us take care of our body. So all you're going to need for that workout is a mat. Now guys, this mat can be bought from any shop, anywhere. You can buy them in your local high street or you can buy them online, okay? So, clear a space in your house, get rid of the sofa or move any um, objects that might be on the floor and make sure that the kids are not in the way so you have all the room that you need, okay? So lay your mat out somewhere nice so you can see me as I do today's workout. Let's get down onto the mat, okay? So, lie down on your side, good, and have your legs straight out, okay? So we're gonna do something known as side planks, okay? Rest your arms above your, so your shoulders here and rest your shoulder in line, like so, and then you're gonna lift up like this, okay? So I'm gonna come back down just to show you exactly what we're doing. So you place one hand in front for balance, the shoulders are in line, Everything is nice and long, and then we're gonna lift up and we're gonna work that waist. Okay, let's go. Lift up, breathe, hold it there for a couple of seconds, and then you drop it down. Excellent, up, hold it there for a couple of seconds, and down. So the waist that we're working, as I said, is here, and the reason why we're working our waist is to give you that nice, shapely look to your figure, okay? so. It can give you that nice hourglass look when you have a nice toned waist. Keep going. Up, and then you're just gonna give me two more, and then we're done, okay? Keep going. Looks very, very easy, but it really, really tries to, it really does work, okay? And last one. Try not to roll forward or back, just try and keep everything straight. Excellent. That was a toughie. And then you do that on the other side, okay? Now. I'm going to make it a little bit harder and what we're going to do is the same side plank but when we go up this time we're going to take our arms up and then you're going to thread through like this. So it's literally like threading a needle. So once you've done the other side, this exercise that we're going to do is your second one on the floor. Here we go. Keep the hands there, let's lift up, hold it, hands straight in the air and thread through. Good. Bring it back down. 
Now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna sit slightly up. Again, still resting here. And we're gonna do some crunches, okay? Now, if you're a beginner, you can do it with one leg. So, both legs are like this, bent slightly. And then you're gonna crunch. So, your knee is gonna meet your elbow. So, we're gonna crunch like so, okay? Now, if you're advanced, you can crunch both together. That's a hard one, because it's like you're balancing. So you have to try and sit. If you're going to use both legs, you're going to have to sit on your bottom. So slightly less forward and slightly back. But I'm going to start it with the one leg so that we can just do it all together. Are we ready? Hands on your head. Here we go. Crunch. Excellent. Bring the elbow to the knee. Good. And making sure that it's the side that is being crunched. Good. And not anything else. Excellent, keep going. Wow, I can really, really feel that. Now, I don't know about you at home, but some people are aware, or some of you might not be aware, one of the main reasons why we try to work our waist is that it reduces the risk of heart disease and diabetes. Because if you have too much fat in that area, in terms of your waist area, then the risk becomes higher. <sighs> keep going. So you're really doing a good job by working your waist. Last one. I can feel this. Oh, excellent. Whew, that was a toughie. So, guys, make sure you, as I say, do it on the other side. Grab a drink, rest anytime you need to. And that's your workout complete. So, as I said, today we've been doing our waist. And thank you so much for joining me in today's fitness segment. And I'll catch you again in our next one. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Thank you very much to Faye. Now don't go away because after the break, Lily Suter gives us a yummy recipe demonstration that you can try this Christmas season. And she also answers your nutritional questions, including this one. My skin is so dry and awful during the winter. Are there any foods I can eat that will help? I've been using special creams, but want to know if there's anything else I can do. Find out what Lily thinks after this break. CB and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone, the TV program that loves to look after your mental health and well-being. So now we have on the program our lovely nutritionist, Lily Souter. Welcome to the show, Lily. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. So you're going to be showing us another healthy, delicious, nutritious recipe, aren't you? Because yeah. just because it's a festive season, it doesn't mean we have to go crazy Absolutely. on the bad stuff. Absolutely. Um, yes. Do you want me to show you the recipe first and then give yes. some tips about staying healthy over I Christmas? I thought you some tips or... first, actually. Okay, like to cool. So as you were saying, sort of, you know, my big ethos is um, to live a life in balance. Mm. And, you know, Christmas is, is there to have fun and food is there for enjoyment as much as it's needed um, for nourishment. But obviously there are a lot of parties and dinners yeah. and nights out that happen and it can be all too easy to overindulge. Um, and as I was saying, it is important to have fun but for some that can take its toll on their waistline mm -hmm. and then people end up in January going on this sort of dreaded January diet um, mm -hmm. which is in, isn't always sustainable um, so I guess I've got three uh, areas which I think is really important to focus on just have a little bit more balance over Christmas okay. Uh, number one is pretty basic, um, but it's just to have breakfast, even mm. on Christmas Day. It sounds really simple, but, you know, there's a lot of research showing that breakfast eaters tend to have more of a balanced diet. They mm. don't sort of snack unnecessarily throughout the day. Uh, they tend to be sort of, they have a lower BMI and if they're overweight, they can lose weight more quickly if they mm. eat breakfast. So it's just really good for appetite control and preventing okay. overeating throughout the day. My second tip is also uh, maybe to focus on the amazing healthy foods that, that are there 
within the Christmas meal, mm. um, such as turkey. It's actually really healthy. If you're going for turkey breast, it's a pretty lean meat. Um, it's full of protein. Yeah. We need protein to maintain our fat burning muscle mass, so to keep metabolism high. Mm -hmm. It's also very rich in a, a component called tryptophan. Um, it's probably one of the richest sources of tryptophan that you can find. Wow. And that is the precursor to our happy hormone serotonin, which is mm -hmm. really cool. Um, obviously the best of veg is really important mm -hmm. and can be really tasty. The potatoes, a lot of people fear uh, the potato side of things. They always think all <laughs> oh, potatoes are gonna make me fat, um, mm -hmm. but it isn't always the case actually. Potatoes in themselves are not fattening. They're actually very rich in sort of things like vitamin C and, and good quality fiber. Mm -hmm. It's more what you're putting the potatoes with. Um, so if they're drenched in butter and like duck fat, that is probably more oh, what's, duck fat. <laughs> yeah, but it's probably more what's going to lead yeah, to the weight yeah, gain yeah, than the yeah, actual the potato, potato themselves. Mm -hmm. And we know that sort of low carb diets, there's no difference between the efficiency of low carb and low fat diets. So, so mm -hmm. don't fear the potatoes you can put a healthy twist to your potatoes by using olive oil which is yes. really great for heart health um, and if you're not using olive oil just be mindful of the additional butters that you're putting yeah. on your potatoes mm -hmm. um, my last tip obviously I think it's probably one which I get asked about a lot um, but it comes to parties and alcohol mm -hmm. and you know as I was saying absolutely fine to drink alcohol over the festive season but if you find yourself drinking on consecutive nights and there are a lot of parties which are going on mm -hmm. it may be worthwhile just picking your drink choice slightly and more wisely um, so the probably the worst offenders when it comes to alcohol are things like beer and um, wine and cocktails they often okay. can be around sort of 250 to 300 calories per per drink wow that's a lot. Um, which is a lot especially yeah. with the wine because we don't we no longer get served sort of small wine glasses mm -hmm. we always given large glasses and wine isn't ridiculously unhealthy it's just the quantities yes yeah. Um, you get a bucket load of course <laughs> absolutely and it's, yeah. it's even with cocktails the average cocktail has around 25 grams of sugar which is wow. our max we our maximum intake of free sugars per day which comes from sort of caster sugars and honeys is around 25 wow. grams that's all we can have and you find that in one cocktail so it's just as long as you're aware of it you yeah, can yeah. moderate um so with clients you know the top drink choice i would say if you're going to be drinking a lot maybe something along the lines of gin or vodka mm -hmm. which is a clear spirit it's got about 65 calories per shot which you know you could have three of those and, and not be even near to a, the same calories as a mm -hmm. beer or a glass of wine um, and what you can mix that with is something like soda water or sparkling water with a squeeze of lemon or lime and mm -hmm. You know, it may not be the tastiest drink, but it's very diluted, so it's less concentrated. It takes a longer time to drink. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, as I was saying, it's about 65 calories per glass. So you could have several of those and, and yeah. not be hitting the calories you'd find in a cocktail. Okay. Um, advice, yeah, <laughs> so it's, yeah, just choosing your drink choices wisely. Okay, lovely. Thank you for those tips. So what are you going to be making for us today? So I'm going to be making um, a cacao or sort of chocolate is another word for it, um, energy ball, mm -hmm. uh, which can be a slightly alternative, healthier alternative to your usual Christmas chocolates. And the only reason why they may be slightly more healthy is because they've got the, uh, there's no sort of refined sugars, it's all coming from the dates. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got lots of almonds in there, which have got the protein. They've also got heart healthy, monounsaturated fats as well. Mm -hmm. Um, raw cacao, uh, which has got lots of antioxidants called yeah. sort of flavanols uh, to support us through the winter. And yeah, we've just got some coconut flakes to, um, yeah. Okay, so take it away, Lily. Cool. <laughs> so first of all, what we have to do is in a blender, mm -hmm. you just place in the dates. You need to make sure that they don't have any pips or any okay. seeds. 
and um, I usually use around half the amount of dates in my energy balls but you can use sort of as many as you require yeah, for, yeah. for what you like but I tend to prefer less sweet energy balls sweet. Okay. Um, and then you put in your sort of cacao so this is the raw chocolate which is full of antioxidants mm -hmm. And then the next ingredient are the almonds, okay. and these will literally grind down in the blender. And these give the energy balls protein, a good source of protein mm -hmm. and healthy fats, which are good for balancing blood sugar. Okay. Um, then a little bit of coconut oil, purely just to help, um, the, help with the consistency okay. of the energy to, balls, to bind it. Bind it together, okay. Um, so a little bit of coconut oil. That's healthy oil as well, isn't it? Yeah, it, 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 you, in, in, in moderation, <laughs> yeah, you can have it in moderation. And um, and then I love nut butter, it's amazing. Yeah. So I've got unsalted um, almond butter here okay. and there's no added weird oils going on in there, no added sugar. Does that also help it to bind it? Yeah. It also yeah. helps to bind it. And again, it's gonna add another good dose of protein and um, healthy fats. Okay. And yeah, and then we literally put the lid onto the blender. And then we blitz it. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. Is that the right consistency? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Great, so now I'm just going to make them into energy balls. Okay. So you literally just get some of the, the mix and you just mold it in your hands into a ball okay. it will feel a little bit greasy but it's going to set in the fridge okay and so once it's in its ball shape you can then decorate it with some coconut okay it smells lovely yeah absolutely and the fact that it's a little bit greasy will help the coconut okay. stick yeah and then just place there it on go. a plate it's a little and snowball. Absolutely. Yes, and then you just okay. leave it in the fridge to set. Lovely. And here's some you made earlier. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's how they look like. And there's one Once nice and set. firm now and absolutely. everything. So absolutely. Lovely. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, we'll Amazing. try one later. Thank you so much, Lily. Something nice and healthy. But just before you go, we do have a few questions from our viewers for you. So um, this person is asking, this was a question we had actually before the break. My skin is so dry and awful during the winter. Are there any foods I can eat that will help? I've been using special creams that want to know if there's anything else I can do. When it comes to skin, a lot of people think it's water that hydrates mm. the skin, but actually essential fats are even more important. So essential fats like omega-3 fats, which you find in fish, oily fish, mm. um, such as mackerel, salmon, herring, sardines, tuna, uh, nuts and seeds. They, those kind of fats actually line every single cell membrane within mm. the body and make it kind of fluid in a way which can give you that dewy sort of glowing skin okay. um, so it's really focusing on getting enough omega-3 fats within mm. the diet and research does suggest that uh, those with sort of skin problems like eczema or psoriasis may benefit from getting more omega-3 fats within the diet. Okay that's interesting okay next question I hate aubergines but I've heard they're really good for you. Do you have any recipes that will help make aubergines tastier? All the ones I've found aren't very healthy. <laughs> okay. So aubergines aren't necessarily an essential within the diet. There's so many different vegetables that you can go for. Mm. Um, but from a health perspective, it's more the way that people cook aubergines because what happens is it absorbs a lot of oil mm. and people tend to roast aubergine and it literally just soaks it all up. Okay. So that's the bit where it may be slightly more unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So if you are roasting aubergine, try and sprinkle some water over the aubergine and, and just a little drizzle of olive oil okay. which can massively help so it's not really really fatty um, I like topping aubergine with loads of different things like some yogurt mixed in with turmeric Ooh, maybe nice. some pomegranate seeds mm. and spices or you could top it with I don't know some minced meat and some cheese you can do sort of whatever you want but it's yeah. more the the oil aspect which is probably okay. the unhealthy bit right. that sounds really nice your, your suggestions yeah. there <laughs> and one last question I've got anemia but hate liver is there anything else I can eat that that will help with my diagnosis? 
Um, absolutely. So liver doesn't, you definitely don't have to eat liver okay. um, for, for iron consumption. Mm -hmm. Iron is obviously found in all meats, it's found in fish. Um, if you're going for plant-based sources of iron, you can get that in things like um, spinach, uh, broccoli, uh, mm. nuts, seeds, dried fruit, lentils, all these sorts of sources yeah. um, are available. I think a key thing with iron, if you're anemic, it's really important to make sure that you are consuming enough vitamin C alongside your iron source. So if mm. you are consuming meat or whether it's I don't know, spinach, making sure you've got a lot of vitamin C rich veg alongside it, or maybe a piece of fruit with each meal, because the vitamin C aids absorption of iron within the body. So right, it's absolutely okay. essential. Lovely. Lily, thank you so much Both for the lovely recipes and also for answering of your questions. And thank we'll see you, you again soon. See you soon. Thank you. Well, don't go away, everyone, because after the break, Sally Wolford shows us how to organise our Christmas decorations and I'll give you some tips on how to best handle confrontation. But first, who forgives easier? Is it men or women? Do you think you know the answer? We'll find out if you're right, right after this break. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show everyone, where today we've been talking all about confrontation. Now before the break, I asked you who forgives easier? Is it men or or women? The answer is actually women. According to Science Daily, men have a harder time forgiving transgressions. However, this change is significantly dependent on how empathetic a man might be. So now onto something different today. Has Christmas decorating got you in a tinsel tangled jumble? Are you up to your ears in disorganized baubles, ornaments and knotted fairy lights? Well, don't worry because resident declutterer Sally Walford and presenter Julianne Robertson are here to help you make your festive decorating easier. Hi, my name's Sally and I'm here with the lovely Julianne. And today we're going to be looking at how to store and organise your Christmas decorations on a budget. I'm actually really excited for this. I know. So yeah, I wanted to do it on a budget as well yeah. because a lot of people at Christmas time or any holiday season yeah. find it very difficult to, you know, sort out their budget. So I've picked some really practical things that you've probably got lying around the house. Okay. And I'm going to show you what I've done with them. So the first one is really simple. It's a plastic box. I'm sure everybody has a plastic box lying around at yeah. home. And what I've done if you could just have a look here, is that I've cut two holes in each end, and then I've found some bamboo sticks out of the garden, oh. as you do, and what I've done is I've hung the baubles on. So as you're taking them off the tree, you can hang them on here, and this is quite good as well for your delicate decorations. So you can do that, and then you just pop the bamboo stick through and there you have it. That's so useful. It's Sally. great, oh isn't gosh. it? And it's also really good if you've got like glass decorations yeah, and things like that. I'm just thinking about if you're actually putting stuff on the tree, instead of having everything lying around, hang them all up in here and then one by one, pop them on. Exactly. This is really so that next year you're going to be fully prepared. Yeah. And also they're going to be really well protected. So you just pop the lid back on the top and pop, in, pop that in your loft. Exactly. Oh, Done. It, they're probably not going to collect any dust or anything either. Exactly, exactly. Oh so yeah, goodness. that's my tip number one. Oh, great, fabulous so, tip. Yeah. All right, off to a good start. So tip number two, lights. Lights are always a bit of a nightmare, aren't they? Yeah. You get them out each year and they're all tangled, tangled up. Tangled up. Exactly. Well, here you go. So get yourself a can, a can of whatever you've got yeah. in, the, in the cupboards, and you wrap your fairy lights okay. around the can. Yeah. So therefore, they will never, ever be tangled again. Yeah. Da, 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 da. And then you just pop that inside. That's amazing. And you can do it for each different kind of fairy light. You can even organize it by color if you're really exactly into it. Exactly. One of my favorite things, actually. So yeah, I'm going to show you some color coordination. Guys. But that really works really well. And it's great. Never, ever a tangled light again. Yeah. 
Do you like the musical fairy lights? Uh, I love musical fairy lights. Yeah. I yeah. Know, I, I love everything lights. about Christmas. It's, it's just brilliant, it's isn't nice it? It's nice You're like, ah, oh, okay, what's next? What's going on? Okay, so I always think um, in organising, that not every system works exactly for everybody. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways of storing the baubles again. Okay. So for example, I mean, this is easy peasy. So everybody's got some eggs, I think, in yeah, there. They do. So let's have That's a look. That's so smart. All your Literally. little tiny baubles, yeah. just pop them in as if they were like eggs. There we go. And then what you can do with those yeah. is put them like that. And, and stick place them on the box. Them there. Okay, so we're also, yeah. you know, op optimizing on our storage space as yeah. well. Like you can stick your smaller ones in there and then your larger ones Larger like, ones along the there. stick. That's so smart. And don't forget you can get deeper plastic boxes as well. Yeah. So you know if you've got longer decorations, you can always adjust this idea. For yeah, those. and promotes the you know, eggs are good for you. Yes, yeah. eggs get, are good get for you. Eggs. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what about the boxes in here? So the other way of storing your baubles is um, to do it in colour. A lot yeah. of people um, find that a lot easier. So you might have one uh, ring of uh, the, tree. The, the tree being silver yeah. and then red. Yeah. So as you take them down, pack them away yeah. in the order that you've done your Christmas tree. Yeah. And then just label them. Um, one, you can mark them from one to 10, yeah. so that you know next year, you're gonna be, that's number one, that's at the top of the tree. Yeah, so. oh, I love, I'm, I'm more of a color organizer, to be honest, and like, this just makes it really great if you're color coordinating just the entire, the entire house, not even the tree. So like all the silver stuff is in one section, all the gold stuff in the other, all the tinsel, for example. Yeah. So that's great, Yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, so moving on, um, this is always, I think garlands are quite tricky. So here's a really good idea. How about your water bottle that you've been taking around? Let's uh, recycle that. Yeah. And we just pop the, pop the garland in. And Sally, it's, what is this? There you go. Again. Oh my goodness. Where's the top gone? There oh yeah, is. there it is. So yeah. And then again, you can either do it in your colour coded system or we can just add to the box. Sally, you're actually blowing my mind right now. <laughs> this is insane. I, I hate them. I hate garlands. Just for the mere fact, because I'm just spending ages and ages just untangling them. So that, that's just a really quick way of just going plop and they're, they're ready exactly. for the Exactly. And you can also take that around the tree with you, you see. Oh, it's even, so I didn't zip, even think of like that. zip. Yeah. Yeah. That's so zip good. around the tree. Oh, that's excellent. Any other thing? Oh, what about the stuff over here? Yeah. So this is just another handy tip and this actually could be not just for Christmas, but yeah. I mean, it's for any leads in general, yeah. actually. Toilet rolls, what a brilliant idea. So, you know, get your cables and you can pop them inside the toilet roll. Yeah. And then we just pop the toilet roll on its end like yeah. that. And I've done it again with my favorite, you see color coded, color coded elastic bands. Yeah. Just so that you remember which part of the tree or which set of lights it belongs yeah. to. So you can And if, if the color coding doesn't work, you can number them. Exactly, exactly. And then the other thing that we've got as well are colour cable ties, which I love. So yeah. again making it very simple then to snip yeah. the cable each each year so yeah there you go there's some there's some of my top tips for christmas decorations I, sally, on a budget just check check out sally walford who can make <laughs> organizing the most exciting thing in the entire world thank you so much oh thanks for, for having me today. no it's always a pleasure <laughs> well right back at you chrissy Thank you very much, ladies. So now it's time for my tips on how to handle conflict. So the very first one that I would say is, don't raise your voice. Now, there is nothing um, worse than actually raising your voice. The other person or people will just shut down immediately if this happens. So anytime you are going to deal with any issues or even if you are in the middle of a, a debate or an argument, make sure your voice isn't raised because no one's going to listen and it's just going to get much, much worse. I know it sounds obvious, but you know, you'd be surprised how easy it is to kind of fall into this trap. So whatever happens, try to calm down and, and not do that. The second point 
is to choose a good time. So if you need to discuss something, don't do it when you and the other person are angry or emotional. You're, you're likely to say something that you regret. Sometimes you'll say things that maybe you don't actually feel, really feel, but you just want to say something to attack the person or make them feel bad because maybe they've made you feel bad. So it's best to actually make sure that it's a good time where you've both calmed down. I wouldn't say leave it too long either because then other, other issues can crop up. But as soon as you know you both or the group has calmed down or both calmed down, then it's a good time to discuss things. The third thing is, don't bring others into it. So if you're expressing how you feel, don't say, oh, and other people feel the same way about it too, and they said the same thing. If, if you will do that, make sure that they are there as well to express themselves. So don't speak for others because you might actually get it completely wrong and actually make the situation worse. So say in the situation of family, oh, your, your, your mum feels the same way and your sister feels the same way. That could actually cause unnecessary conflict in the family. So make sure if, if you are going to discuss something with something make someone make it about you and the person and don't bring other people into it that maybe weren't even there in the first place and maybe you're you're kind of referring to other situations that have happened with those people in the past even so make sure everyone is together if you are going to have something like a family discussion the next point is don't be defensive so this one is easier said than done because no one likes to kind of admit their faults or say that they're wrong but it's really really important that you actually listen to the other person properly don't just pretend you're listening and not take anything in that they've actually said and maybe you know you pretend to listen and then you just come back with your point so your point actually may indeed be very valid but it doesn't mean that you weren't at any fault at all so so hear the person out and i've spoken about this before when i used to have these massive arguments with my my boyfriend now husband but there were times when most of the times I wasn't listening to a word he was saying I just wanted to get my point across and how hurt I was and that he was completely wrong and he shouldn't have treated me that way and I was not listening to what he had to say because in my mind it was like nothing that he says to me can justify what had happened can justify his behavior and so I, I just shut I was just completely shut down I didn't want to hear what he had to say I just wanted him to apologize so in, the, in but the thing is when you actually give the person a chance anyway even if you feel they're completely wrong they're completely out of order what they did was completely wrong hear them out because you might actually be surprised at something that they say that you, you, you didn't even realize that you were doing or thinking or or putting across and that's exactly what happened when I first started to really listen to my boyfriend and really take in what he was saying this was after we started to get counseling by the way so um when, but when I started to understand him, then I, I could see where I was going wrong as well and that we both actually needed to work on something. It wasn't just him, it was me as well. And as soon as we started to work together, that's when all the issues were sorted out. The next point I'd like to talk about is to avoid alcohol. Now, um, I have mentioned this in a couple of points recently, just because, you know, we, we are in the kind of festive, well, we are in the festive season and people do tend to drink more than normal. They're going to like more parties, more family gatherings and things like that. But if you know there's tension already, maybe with um, certain people in your workplace, for example, when you're going to the office, do. I would say avoid alcohol because someone might say something and everything will just kick off. Same with family members. You know that you're going to that family gathering and there are kind of conflicts that maybe haven't been spoken about or things have happened in the past and um, you know think that hasn't really been dealt with but now you're all going to be together and everyone's going to be drinking and then you know what can happen so just if, if you are if you know yourself and you are the kind of person that gets really loud or leery and mouthy when you drink probably best to avoid alcohol if you can just so you don't get dragged in even if other people kick off at least you're going to stay calm and, and you know try to be the peacemaker instead and the next point is the last one I'd like to talk about is to admit your faults. Again, very difficult to do. Um, no one likes to admit they've done something wrong. No one likes to admit that you know they failed in some way. However, when you do, and I think this one especially in, in relationships, when you admit your faults to the other person, it makes the other person as well more likely to admit their faults, and that's when you can really start communication going and sorting issues out that you may have. It's, I think it's really, really important. Well, everyone, I hope that's helped you. And if you have a story that you would like to share, please. 
do email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at Chrissy B Show or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to know more about me and my mental health journey, you can visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Conflict is defined as a disagreement, whereas confrontation, oh, it's moving, Julia. Okay. So it is really important to start doing it when it's a frustration, okay. rather than before it escalates. Right, nice and I forgot my question. Hang on, it'll come back. Well, everyone, don't go away because after the break, we show you a video courtesy of Head Talks on how one Instagram... <laughs>